Well, again, thank you all for being here tonight. Tonight is our last study sermon on prayer. Uh, Next Sunday morning and night, Daniel will be preaching. So two Sundays from now, we'll start a new series in the morning and at night. The study in the morning is going to be on church membership and what we need to look like as members of Oak Street Baptist. And the Sunday night is going to be a little different. I've never taught on this stuff as a group. I've taught on angels before and, excuse me, I've taught on demons before, but never together in a spiritual warfare context. So that will be our Sunday night series starting in two weeks is Angels, Demons, and Spiritual Warfare. I've had a lot of questions from different people, so I thought that'd be a neat study to go through. As I thought about how to end our study on prayer, I asked one question, and it resulted in this answer. (laughs) The answer is sometimes we need to do more than pray. Prayer's good. But sometimes we need to do more than pray. You may, you may question that. You may say, Pastor, I thought prayer was good enough. Sometimes that is all we can do. But sometimes we need to do more. So if you would, let's all please stand for the reading of God's Word because God's Word is inerrant, God's Word is infallible, and God's Word is inspired. We're going to open up with this verse out of the book of James. James chapter 2, verse 17. And if you know the book of James, James writes and he discusses faith and James discusses works and especially what James does is he discusses the relationship between faith and works. This is what James tells us in James 2, 17. James says this, in the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. Let me read that again. In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. Let's open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, let me take a moment to thank you for who you are. That you are a living, loving God that loves to hear from His people. Lord, on this last sermon lesson on prayer, Lord, You call us to get out of our comfort zones. James tells us that that faith is good, but without acting upon it, without that works part, our faith can be dead. Lord, burden our hearts that we take prayer to the next level and we actually act upon it. For it's in the precious In the holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So we're going to look at a couple of things that we pray about and how we can take that to the next step or the next level. Number one, we pray for people to be saved, but do not share the gospel with them. We pray for people to be saved, but we do not share the gospel with them. We should share our faith with others. It's good to pray for the salvation of our kids, of our grandkids, of strangers. But you know what? The lesson, the sermon this morning, the lesson taught out of that is discipleship is action. It's good to pray for our lost people in the community, but if we don't share our faith, if we don't disciple them, Let's be honest, that that faith is dead. It means nothing. Why? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So church, it's good to pray for lost people, but we are to share our faith with them. Share the gospel with them. Like I mentioned this morning, Jesus commands us to make disciples. And part of that is doing something. We start off by prayer. But if that's as far as we go, we fail. So how many, and I don't, this is rhetorical, but how many of us pray for people to, do, to be saved and then don't do nothing about it? I mean, we're all guilty of that. 
I've got lost loved ones that I need to do a better job of sharing my faith with them. I pray for them constantly. But we need to do more. And these are going to kind of be rapid fire because I've got several of them. Number two, we pray for God to bring a wayward believer back into the fold, but we do not confront that believer. Listen to that. My, I need to make sure I don't use that again. That, can y'all see that? Okay, okay. That's kind of hard to see. That it's small in the text. But anyway, we pray for God to bring a wayward believer back into the fold, but we do not confront that believer. This is hard to say, but you guys know it's true. There's probably not a one of us, including the new person, me, that's only been here four and a half months, that probably couldn't write down a dozen or more names of people that should have been here this morning that wasn't. Think about that. Amen. We pray that they come back, but what else do we do? And when I say confront, that does not mean being mean and ugly and shaming them. But you know what? Sometimes we need to confront people in their sin. In a loving way. We as a church, as individuals, as members of this church, should be committed to restoring believers back to God and back to the local church. You guys know as well as I do, if everybody that's on our rolls, if everybody we count as members were to show up on one Sunday, we'd probably just about probably not be able to fit them in here. So... We pray that those people come back to church and do what they need to do and be involved. But do we reach out to them? I know some of us do, but I know some of us probably don't. So let me challenge you this week. Reach out to somebody you know should be here. Tell them you miss them. Tell them you love them. If they're in sin, tell them you're praying about, praying about them. And I, I say this like this is an easy thing to do. It is not. I've shared this before. I remember when me and Gina first got married, she was a new nurse, and new nurses get 7P to 7A. You work night shift. And I was working uh, security, working on my undergrad, and I was a security guard working night shift. <clears throat> And you know the last thing you want to do when you get home at 7, 7.30 a.m., 8 a.m.? Go to church at 10 and 11 a.m. So, guess what? We would go home, go to bed, and not want to get back from out from under them covers. And I remember I had a good pastor, the man that was over my ordination. And he called and he let me know, David, y'all need to be at church. If it wasn't for the boldness of Brother Don Shipman, I might not be where I am today behind this pulpit. God works through those who do more than pray. It took a lot of boldness for Don to confront me about not being at church like I should have been. But like I said, I'm grateful every day for that. Number three. We pray for God to provide financially for our church, but we offer no stewardship training for members. Kind of makes sense. <laughs> if all your members don't know how to budget and don't know how to... And I'm talking especially for, um, you know, we came from seminary, and seminarians are usually full of 20 and 30-year-olds. And believe it or not, you guys probably know this, having kids and grandkids in college now, they don't teach a lot of the basics anymore in high school and college, like budgeting, finance, and things like that. So when, you're, when, you, when you have new members that are younger and, and they're eat up to their eyeballs in debt, they can't tithe. So a lot of churches have realized that if you want people to be able to tithe and, and you want uh, God to be able to provide for His church through their members... You need to provide some kind of stewardship training because parents ain't doing it hardly. Uh, schools certainly ain't doing it. So, you know, 
We pray about these things, but are we providing the tools that people need? And I kind of roll my eyes at myself because the first sentence I have here is if we aim at nothing, we hit it every time. Especially with stewardship training. If we don't train people how to save money and how to budget, they will not be able to give to God like God requires. One of the best things me and Gina ever did, and it wasn't the church I was pastoring, it was one of my buddy's churches. Uh, They offered Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. It cost a little bit of money. I think it was like a hundred bucks. But that's where me and Gina really learned how not only to work with money, but to work with money in God's way. And there's a difference. It taught us that giving back to God should be at the top of our budget, not at the end. Number one, you're able to do more that way. And number two, you're able to make God your top priority when it comes to giving. And we need to do that more. Number four, we pray for God to free us from a controlling sin, but we keep putting ourselves in the same wrong place with the same wrong people at the same wrong time. That's a mouthful. I'll repeat it. We pray for God to free us from a controlling sin, but we keep putting ourselves in the same wrong place with the same wrong people at the same wrong time. Satan loves this type of manipulation. Well, if I can get this person to be busy, busy, busy over here, they won't be able to do anything for God. If I give this person this temptation that I know that they love... They'll fall for it every single time. We pray for God to keep us from sin. Then we go dive head first into temptation, knowing good and well we will sin. And guess what? Your sin is different than my sin. And my sin is different than your sin. Satan knows how to keep us from doing God's will. And he uses it. If we do not want to sin, we should keep ourselves out of situations to sin. That sounds like common sense. Me being called to be a pastor puts me as a spiritual example to the church. And I'm not foolish enough to think it don't. And I understand that every situation is different. But for me and Gina, we decided about that same time that we were going to be committed to God in His house. Gina, as a new nurse, was offered several different positions. Some day shift and several different raises. But you know what one of the big things was? Working on Sunday. And you can't be a pastor and a pastor's wife and not be at church. You just can't do it. That would have been an easy temptation to fall into as a young couple. So not every sin is adultery. Not every sin is one of those big ones, murder, love, whatever you want to list. Sometimes sin can be good things like pay raises. Sometimes sin can be good things like family. You know, I know good church people. When certain family members come into town, they just don't go to church. Be careful. Let me encourage you. Go to church. They may not come with you, but you can be an example and show them the priority that you have in Christ. I've got a cousin, and she is a devout atheist. Me and her discuss things all the time. She's my oldest cousin on my mom's side. But you know what? She's been to church with me. And there's times where I've woken up on Sunday morning and she spent the night hanging out with me and Gina and we've left her on the couch and me and Gina went to church. We showed her the priority that Christ is in our lives. It would have been easy to say, well, it's a family member. We don't get to see them that often. It'll be all right. 
But maybe one of these days that will sink in. Number five. We pray for God to give us clarity about an issue, but we have not opened His Word on a regular basis in a long time. We pray for God to give us clarity about an issue, but we have not opened His Word on a regular basis in a long time. I can't be any more clear than this. This is the way now for millennia, thousands of years, that God has chosen to speak to His people. I mean, just look at Timothy. Look at Jesus quoting the Old Testament. This is the way God has chosen to speak to His people for millennia. So when we have an issue, guess where we need to go for clarity? It's the Bible. And it's that simple. Um, You know, people want to go this way and go this way. and That is not the way Christians should handle seeking clarity in their lives. We should seek God and His Word. God continues to speak through His Word. If you have an issue, it's probably in the Scriptures. And if we want to know the Lord's will for our lives, we must, must, must read our Bibles. I don't want to be too ugly. But I mean, this is stuff that should be taught in our youngest Sunday school classes. But I, as the spiritual leader of the church, need to be reminded of this. Because it's too easy to want to seek secular wisdom over God. We need to seek God's will through God's Word. Number six. We pray for God's will, but we already know what we are going to do. We pray for God's will, but we already know what we are going to do. If I had to pick one of these where I fail the most, it's probably right here. And if you guys are honest, you probably fail here at least sometimes. You know, how many times do we honestly go to God in prayer? And basically the prayer is, God bless my decision. <laughs> you know, I, I, looking back, and you guys are probably honest too, Looking back, I can honestly say that I thank the Lord He didn't answer a lot of my prayers that were self-centered, that were ignorant, and that were not seeking His will. And the clearest example I have now, it would have been easy for me to show up last Sunday and say, guys, let me tell you about my buddy Daniel. But that's not the way it happened. Let me explain. I want you to know that I've been praying about this for months and months and months. I knew it would be a good opportunity, but it may not be God's will. So you know what? The Lord just kept laying it on my heart. And I said, okay, David, you can be stupid. Why don't you take it to the deacons? Why don't you have them pray about it for several, a couple, several months? And let them confirm what God has laid upon your heart. So that's what I did. I brought it to the deacons. Uh, and I said, guys, don't let me scare you. And I started throwing resumes on the table at them and talking to them about them. And I said, guys, I know we're not going to make this decision tonight or tomorrow. All I want you guys to do is pray. That's all I ask. Pray. So you know what? Things got better. I seen the, the I got some feedback from the deacons and yoke fellows. So we decided to, to move forward and, and I started talking to Daniel and God started lining every single thing up. And I said, Lord, you've laid it on my heart. The deacons have confirmed it. Let me go before the church. And that's what I did last Sunday. And I'll be honest. Unless you guys call me in the next two days. I have not received one 
negative thought or feedback. Not one. Now, I'm not foolish enough to think there's not a little bit of hesitancy and (coughs) different things like that. But I see God's hand moving. That's the way that I handled this situation well. And we've only got another 20 minutes, or I could tell you about 10,000 that I probably haven't handled well. But we need to seek God's will in our lives, especially our prayer lives. Because too many times, like I said, we come up with a great idea, we come up with this great thing, and we say, Lord, I've got this idea, bless it. It's not the way it works. Number seven, we pray for God to give the church mature believers to help lead the congregation, but we have no equipping strategy to raise them up. We pray for God to give the church mature believers to help lead the congregation, but we have no equipping strategy to raise them up. I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like discipleship to me because that's what this is. If we want strong leaders, if we want strong teachers, if we want strong deacons, if we want strong, you name it, AV, nursery, whatever. Whatever it may be, we must disciple and train others to fill these positions. I'll be honest with you. One of the first things that when I get Daniel over here, the one, one of the first things I'm going to do is I want to sit down with our Sunday school and children's church workers. Why? Because I want to hear their feedback. I want to hear their direction. Because I want this question to be answered. And I'll use my youngest as the example. What does Oak Street Baptist Church want Haley and McBriar to know by the time she graduates children's church and by the time she graduates high school? What do we want her to know? If we can't answer that question, we're going to have to figure it out. And if we can answer that question, we're going to have to figure out how to teach that and how to get that into her spiritual life. Again, sometimes we just go willy-nilly about life. We can't do that. If, if we want Haylin to know the big attitudes, if we want her to know how to teach a Sunday school class by the time she's out of high school, Because believe it or not, I've seen some of the way our teenagers teach and they're good. So Oak Street's done a good job. But that's one thing that I want to look at and have a clear direction to help our children's church workers and our uh, Sunday school workers. Was that number seven? Yeah. Number eight. We pray about our needs but are not repenting from our wrongs. We pray about our needs, but we are not repenting from our wrongs. Boy, this one stings a little bit. Um, You know, none of us are sinless. But I'm afraid if I don't watch my prayer life... I pray a lot more about needs and wants than I do about confession of sin to God. You know, I'm trying to remember this morning, but the Lord laid it on my heart when I first started praying to end the service. You know, I prayed for God to forgive me of my sins knowingly and unknowingly. Because, you know, I've been told by my loving wife, sometimes I can be a little brash. You know, sometimes you may ask me a question and, and it may seem like I blow you off and I don't mean to be that way. That, that, that's my nature. So, you know, sometimes I sin unknowingly and I don't mean to be and you don't mean to be either. And I would never want to hurt no one's feelings or, or cause them not to want to come to church. So, you know, a lot of times when I pray, I'm like, Lord, forgive me of the sins that I know about. Lord, please forgive me of the sins I don't know about. We've got to be careful about the way we pray and pray about repenting of our sin. We are good about telling God what we won't need, but rarely, rarely, rarely confess our sins to God. Number nine. We pray about something, 
But do not forgive someone who has wounded us. We pray about something, but we do not forgive someone who has wounded us. Forgiveness is hard, and let's not pretend that it's not. Jesus tells us in the model prayer that we should forgive others if we want God to forgive us of our sins. Let this sink in. How would we feel if God forgave us the same way we forgive others? Let that sink in. How would we feel if God forgave us the way we forgive others? Boy, I sure am glad God's long-suffering, merciful, kind. (laughs) Because sometimes I'm afraid David can't be that way, and sometimes you guys can't be that way. And I said forgiveness is hard, but church, we're required to do it. This is something that's even hard for mature believers. It's hard for me. I don't like it when people do me wrong. I don't like it when people are ugly to me and mean. You would think that churches and church members could never be that way, but me and Gina often talk about scars that we still hold from church members. Not that we haven't forgiven them, but you know... I'm not stupid enough to forget. And my old, and I don't even have this in my notes. Man, this is good. Listen to this. My Old Testament professor had just got done dirty by the church he pastored. And everybody knew it. I mean, they did him dirty. He's teaching through Genesis, my favorite book of the Bible. And Dr. Mosley starts talking about Joseph. And his brothers, remember? They, sold, they, want, they wanted to kill him, but sold him into slavery. And, and this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And that man of God was teaching, lecturing, and was weeping. And he said, guys, which there were girls in the class, but he said, guys, listen. In my older years, I've come to realize this one thing. Every time that God brings something like that upon my recollection, God gives me another chance to forgive them. Dude, that hit deep. Every time God brings something upon your mind where someone's done you dirty, someone's been mean to you, God's given you another opportunity to forgive them. Because guess what? They're sleeping like a baby that night. They probably don't even remember what they did to you. All you're hurting is yourself. So when God, when those memories come to your recollection, it's an awesome opportunity to seek God and to forgive them for what they did. <clears throat> the last, but certainly not least... Number 10, we pray for God to use us in a role at the church, but are lazy about preparation and training and do not take that role seriously. We pray for God to use us in a role at the church, but we are lazy about preparation and training and do not take that role seriously. I seen a statistic that scared me to death about a month ago. And this guy, Dr. Tom Rayner, he's, he's got a Ph.D. in ministry. But his undergrad at the University of Alabama is in finance and banking, and he comes from like seven generations of bankers. So he's, he's just statistically minded. He loves numbers. And I don't remember the exact number, but he sends out polls all the time. I get them, and they're anonymous. You can answer them honestly. And I believe it was about 60 to 70% of pastors and Sunday school teachers said they do the bulk of their work. Guess when? Saturday nights. Pastors and Sunday school teachers do the bulk of their work on Saturday nights. 
Now, if you think about this, what does that tell you? Number one, they're probably rushing. They're tired. They've had a hard week of work, and I understand that. But are we really giving God our all? And I'll be honest, sometimes my sermons ain't done to the end of the week. And notice I said done. Because the first thing I do on Monday mornings is I read through my scripture several times. And I let that marinate in my heart and in my mind. And usually late Monday or Tuesday, I come up with an outline of what you see on the PowerPoints. I get my three, four big points, and I have that mapped out. And then I do this, this, and this Wednesday. And 90-something percent of the time, my sermons are concluded by Thursday afternoon. Why? Because I'm off on Fridays and Saturdays. I want to give that time to my family. Because they sacrifice in other areas. Now, have I been up late Saturday nights working on sermons? Yep. (laughs) I mean, we're human, right? But that shouldn't be every week. I shared this past Wednesday night that the average pastor spends 20 hours a week preparing one sermon. Now, I've been doing this for over 20 years, so... I don't average that much. I'll say about 10 to 12 hours per sermon. So I'm doing Sunday night, Sunday morning. So that averages to about 20 to 24 hours a week. You know, I would be scared to death if I waited to Saturday night. And it would probably show. And I want my sermons done by Thursday, not only for my family, but for my mental benefit. I need to, and there, hey, there are times on Sunday morning when I'm sitting in my office and I'm praying and God will give me another illustration. That, that's okay. But God has called me to spiritually lead this church and I need to take that seriously. Let me put a nice little bow on tonight. It is awesome to pray. Awesome. But some things require a little bit more than prayer. Like I started off reading in James, if all we do is pray, we fail. Prayer should produce works. Don't just pray for someone to get saved. Share your faith with them. Invite them to church. Don't just pray for church members to come back. Call them on the phone. Offer for them to come to church with you and you take them out to lunch. It might cost you 8 to $10, but that's okay. <laughs> God will bless you in other ways. So I gave you 10 things tonight. But the theme is this. It's time to get busy. I've taught now for two months on prayer. Now it's time to put that into action. So church, let's bow our heads and pray. But let's get ready to get busy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. And Lord, we do thank you. Lord, forgive me because everyone that I've mentioned, God, I failed in in my life. But God, I've also done a few good things. And Lord, I ask that you continue to burden my heart and my soul to not only pray, but God to do. Lord, let Oak Street Baptist Church be known as a church that gets things done. If there's a need in the community, let's do something about it. If there's an opportunity for us to witness and share our faith with lost people, Lord, let us do that. Lord, I don't know what you've laid on everybody's heart and mind. But I know you're a good God. And I know you want to be served by us doing. For it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen.